Captured in California, the Hawaii Loa Ridge murder suspects have been arrested. The first encounter it can be really, really critical to how the whole story plays out in the end. And breaking tonight, citing a lack of probable cause, Los Angeles authorities have released one of the two suspects. There needs to be evidence that both of them were actually involved. H&N has confirmed that 34-year-old Scott Hannon was released tonight from custody. Just a day after being captured following this intense manhunt. They fled. Hawaii News now has obtained this surveillance video that appears to show the suspects at a Waikiki hotel before fleeing. They really didn't have a clue that these guys were involved at all, or they made a huge mistake. A neighborhood remains in shock. Never to something of this degree. And there's a lot of questions about how these men were able to get off the island. You cannot hold a person in custody unless there's probable cause. I'm Jonathan Jared Sapi in the H&N Digital Center. I'll be joined by Chief Investigative Reporter Lynn Kuano for this special edition of The Other Side of Paradise. Lynn, I got to say, everything from the crime scene to yesterday's dramatic arrest, like an episode of Dateline, and I really want to, to break down everything we know so far. Let's work backward and start with what happened yesterday with that arrest. Yesterday, it was a, a pretty big arrest. U.S. Marshals were needed for this arrest because it was out in California, the Los Angeles area, and the, the men had split up, obviously. So, so that was what was very interesting, was the men decided they couldn't stay together anymore. Scott Hannon, 34, he was arrested later in the afternoon yesterday. Juan Tejedor Barron, 23-year-old, he was actually arrested first. So he was arrested, according to the U.S. Marshals and Honolulu Police, in a Greyhound bus. It was kind of interesting because they say that he was hiding in a crawl space. So he pulled back a metal plate and hid inside an enclosure in the bench seat. Absolutely just mind blowing that he knew that was there or how to get into there. Now, what I was told by Honolulu police sources is that the U.S. Marshals, the deputy U.S. Marshals up there in the Los Angeles area had actually been watching them for a little while when they were notified that these fugitives had made it to their area to California. So the U.S. Marshal's office had been tailing them for a little while. Perhaps they saw him get into the crawl space is the only way I can know that, that they yeah. were able to find him in there because that is pretty crazy to hear that they were hiding in that area. And Baron, according to the uh, to the U.S. Marshals and Honolulu Police, he was on a Greyhound bus trying to get to Mexico. What I do know about him from sources is that his passport was taken by Honolulu Police before they dropped them off in Waikiki, which is a whole other story in and of itself, Jonathan. But they took his passport, and perhaps that's why he was also hiding in this crawl space trying to get to Mexico because he really didn't have a way to get over there. And Hannon captured in a very popular part of the Los Angeles area, right? You're familiar with it. Yeah, Inglewood, near the Forum, near the SoFi Stadium. In fact, um, I, I stayed there with a cameraman, Davis Pittner, before the Super Bowl. That intersection, very busy area. Um, not the best part of town, but certainly a very busy part of town, uh, maybe about a mile and a half from SoFi Stadium and from the Forum, so, so a really popular area. He was found more around the 6 o'clock or, or later in the afternoon, the evening hours, um, California time yesterday. But Rowan was picked up about 2.30 Hawaii time. And we got to mention that tonight H&N has confirmed that Hannon was released from custody from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Uh, we learned about this shortly before our 4 p.m. newscast and Lynn broke it to you there. So tonight we got HPD's retired Deputy Chief John McCarthy's take on this. Here's what he had to say. It wasn't there. You know, I can only know what what's been out there in the media and what's been told to me. But clearly, um, you know, there was insufficient um, evidence to hold this person or issue the warrant, it, I think, at this point. Um, having been involved in extraditions um, before, uh, California law allows the officers to make that call at their, at their point, not without even conferring with the uh, um, prosecutors on their end, but just on what they're told from the Honolulu Police Department. It looks like that's what they did. They made that call and let them go. So this happens a lot, right? When, when, a, when suspects or defendants flee, though, the state, it makes them look guilty. And, and then how difficult is it then to get them, bring them back, and, and deal with circumstances like this? 
sometimes it can be really difficult. It depends on the individual, how far he pushes it. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of factors come into play. How far it, you know, does he roll over and just say, yeah, take me back to Hawaii or does he fight the extradition? Then it becomes a long drawn out process. And, you know, our, the people assigned to our extradition detail talk to their extradition detail. They're constantly talking. Um, it's, this case is a little bit more unusual when it comes to extradition though, because uh, normally we're dealing with warrants, warrants that are issued by judges, by grand juries, by the prosecutors, uh, arrest warrants written by the police department. Uh, here, I don't know what they are, you know, did we have probable cause to even believe he was a suspect at this point? Uh, it seemed like the facts or the circumstances played out very fast. And did the police department have enough information? Did they have enough uh, evidence to call anybody a suspect at this point? So both these guys were captured a day after they were last seen, right? So run us through about what you know about their whereabouts the last few days. Monday was when the missing persons report came in to the Honolulu Police Department. And that came in because the brother of the man who owns the home on Hawaii Lower Bridge, the 73-year-old, called saying he hadn't heard from his brother in weeks, really almost months. So police did a welfare check Monday. They didn't see any signs of foul play or anything suspicious. So they made a missing persons report. Um, I assume no one let them into the house, and that's why they left. Hours later is when detectives from the missing persons unit went over there. Uh, according to what police tell us, the men were there at the home uh, and they allowed them to go into the home and they saw something suspicious, the bathtub with concrete and some other substances on it. They became suspicious, got everybody out and they were waiting for a warrant at that point. And we've got this new surveillance video release that appears to show Hannon and Barone walking around the Waikiki Grand there on Kapahulu by the zoo. The two men are seen in the video holding hands and casually walking around. And we got to keep in mind that Barone, the younger suspect, is said to be in a relationship with the elderly victim, right? So here's something that's come into question today. The video is timestamped 358, but... That timestamp, if it's correct, it sort of raises questions about HPD's timeline and the events that happened on Monday afternoon. I want to play out some sound from an HD, HPD presser when they were discussing just that. At about 4 o'clock p.m., missing persons detectives were notified and responded to the scene to continue the investigation where they met with a 23-year-old male who claimed to reside at the victim's residence. It was then determined that the victim had an intimate relationship with this 23-year-old male. Consent was obtained by detectives, the missing person detectives, to check the residence and continue to search for the victim. However, the victim was still not located. Upon searching the home, a standalone tub was, a tub was observed to be filled with concrete-type mixture. During the investigation, the 23-year-old male left the residence with another 34-year-old. So obviously we have some questions there for HPD regarding that timeline. Um, you know what, Lynn, why don't you tell us a little more about this victim? What do we know about him? Well, he hasn't been officially identified yet, but we believe he is the 73-year-old owner of the home in Hawaii Lower Ridge. It's a very exclusive neighborhood. It is beautiful. It's gated. Uh, beautiful ocean views up there. The home, the last time we looked, which was valued you know, years ago, was $2 million. Wow. Obviously, with the real estate market the way it is now, it is a, a much higher value on that home. 73-year-old owner of Lele Kepue Place property, uh, we believe he is the victim. Police say, said that they believe that is the victim as well. But obviously, it will take a little while to get positive identity based on the decomposition of the body and, and really the circumstances surrounding how they tried to dispose of this body, allegedly. Yeah, we're not yet releasing that victim's name until we get that official confirmation. But I did want to play out a little bit more from that HPD presser describing what investigators found at the scene earlier this week. Uh, the body was in the uh, standalone tub and it was in a state of decomposition once we uh, chipped away at the concrete mixture. Can you describe this tub? I'm, I'm kind of confused. What kind of tub? Are we talking about a 50 gallon? It's drum? a standalone, it's a standalone bathtub. It's an actual bathtub, a standalone bathtub. And it was filled with concrete? Um, there was a concrete and a layer of coffee on the top. And talking more about that neighborhood, Lynn, we got an interview in with someone who lives in that community 
and they're just in shock. I want to play out what they had to say. Absolutely terrible that that happened. I mean, we've never had a serious crime like this happen before. Um, we've heard of small robberies, but never to something of this degree. Uh, I go jogging down that street, and um, I would hate to encounter any, anyone who lives there and associated with that. Definitely make me more conscious. I definitely go with somebody next time. Now I got to get to the question everyone is asking, and you've been doing a great job exploring. Why did HPD let these guys hop off the island? What went down? What happened? On Monday, when police say the two men were at the home of the crime scene, they didn't have enough probable cause. Probable cause is a low standard. They just have to have a belief that a crime was committed. But at that point, they didn't know exactly what was in the bathtub. They didn't see a murder weapon. They didn't see this massive crime scene. So they decided they didn't have enough probable cause to detain the men or to arrest the men. So instead, Honolulu police gave them a ride to Waikiki. I know it sounds really bad. It does happen. It's called a courtesy transport. Another reason, HPD wanted the car. The younger man had a car in his name. It, it's believed that the 73-year-old, they had a romantic relationship and that the car was purchased for this younger man. Police wanted the car. So in exchange, they gave him a courtesy transport to Waikiki. The problem is, it doesn't appear that HPD put anyone to tail these men. Anyone from the crime reduction unit, the plainclothes officers, CID, no one was following them. So when police dropped them off at the Hilton in Waikiki, no one even checked that they checked into the hotel. In fact, they didn't check into the hotel, is what sources tell me. They went on their way. Now, they were seen at several other bars um, over the next few hours. It's not clear exactly when they went to the airport or how they got on a plane, but it wasn't that far after or that long after that it's believed they hopped on a plane, skipped town. There were no restrictions on them because they were not being detained, because they had not been arrested. They were free to move around. They could go anywhere they wanted to on the island. And as we're seeing now, they were able to hop on a plane to California. And more on about how many experts say they should have been followed. You talked to defense attorney Megan Cow former deputy city prosecutor who explained a lot to you. Let's play out that sound. Oh, this is the United States of America. What that means is that under our United States Constitution and our Hawaii State Constitution, the government cannot just pluck an individual off of the street and detain that person. Police have to have probable cause to believe someone has committed a crime before the police officer can even detain the person. You cannot hold a person in custody unless there's probable cause. Now, the probable cause standard is very low. All it is is the reasonable person would believe that a crime has been committed but you still have to meet that standard. If you don't meet that standard, you cannot detain a citizen. Jonathan, I also spoke to another former deputy prosecutor, Victor Baki, who is now a defense attorney, and he echoed what Megan said. He said, if there's no probable cause, you cannot hold them. Uh, you know, you, you really need to release them. And, and perhaps this was a way that police could somewhat know where they were dropping them off. Um, but he also said some type of surveillance should have been done on them, whether it was an undercover officer following them or just keeping tabs on them. There needed to be something because now you have to have this whole operation, right? Once they leave town, now you have to get the feds involved. You got to get the feds over in California to help out. It's no longer in your control. The Honolulu Police Department lost control of these suspects when they let them go without following them. And that's why the U.S. Marshals had to come in and take over and, and follow them, track them, find them, and then get them arrested. And I wanted to play out just a little bit of that interview you did with Victor, also echoing what you just said. So here's what he had to say. They do have the ability to detain people so that they can just assess the situation. They can request identification. Um, they can do things like that. Um, but if they don't feel that they have enough probable cause, then they do have to let the people go on their way, so to speak. But that doesn't stop them from assigning a, a criminal investigation unit to follow them, to track them, to make sure that they don't just run and get on a plane and flee while they're under investigation. Um, so it's a very preliminary thing, but 
the probable cause standard is so low that if they have any real suspicion, then they have the full legal authority to arrest and hold for 48 hours. So if they didn't do that, that's telling us that they really didn't have a clue that these guys were involved at all or they made a huge mistake. And now the process begins of extradition, right? Now we have this whole new process that we have to go through. We could have a series of, of other issues ahead of us. And of course, we do want to remind everyone of tonight's breaking news. I'm going to read it off of HawaiiNewsNow.com. H&N has confirmed that 34-year-old Scott Hannon was released from custody of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. We've also learned that he has not been transferred to any other agency's custody. And we talked to law enforcement expert Tommy Iu about how that capture yesterday might have went down. Here's what he had to say. But the process is they have to develop a probable cause that the two people, the two suspects, are linked directly to the homicide. So in that case, they have to collect, when they did the search warrant the other day at the residence, collect DNA, uh, other indicia, other evidence. And once they do that, they put it together. They still have to wait for the forensics to come back. The probable cause for the uh, warrant for the homicide, once it's approved by the prosecutor's office and signed by a state judge, then the FBI can get what is known as a UFAP warrant unlawful flight to avoid prosecution and that allows the jurisdiction anywhere in the country for federal agents to arrest that individual for the state charge and that's what probably happened the individuals were on, under surveillance they knew what flight they were taking they alerted tsa the sheriff's office uh, it, at the airport put them on the plane and as soon as uh they got that warrant signed and they were uh, disembarked in la um, maybe there was some time that they still didn't have the warrant but they followed them to the Greyhound station. The other guy was in Inglewood. The warrant came through. They can make the arrest. All right, Lynn, uh, before I let you go, what else can you tell us about these suspects? According to HPD, they had IDs, passports, residences in Boston or Texas. So, so they're visitors. But we don't know how long they've been here, right? Obviously, if one of them had a relationship with the victim, according to police, how long did that relationship go on? And how long was the man dead in that home? So all of that is being worked out right now. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting, Honolulu police did take the ID or did take the passport of one of them. How did they get out of town Good without point. the passport? Yeah. Did they have IDs? Did they have fake IDs? You know, we, we don't know those things. Hopefully we'll get some of those details coming out in the next few days. All right, Lynn Kuano, keep up the great reporting, which I'm sure you will. And we'll check back in with you as this story develops. You're going to want to stay with Hawaii News Now for continuing coverage of the Hawaii Loa Ridge murder investigation. Don't forget, Lynn Kuano has a podcast called The Other Side of Paradise. You can find it by searching Hawaii News Now wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for watching or listening to this special report.